Well, thanks everyone for joining our Soil Changing Farmers webinar series. This will be a four part series and uh, each of the panelists or each of the people that we'll be featuring are from four very different areas. Uh, today, our guests are from uh, Merced, California. And uh, just gonna share a little bit about their uh, regenerative story. Um, we often talk within this movement or whatever we might call uh, this type of agriculture, what is regenerative? That's the phrase that we like to use, um, but there's, there's a lot of questions around what that actually means. Uh, I would suggest that the O'Crowley's Orchard is one of the best pictures that I can really picture of what a regenerative farm looks like. They're gonna talk about uh, just the many practices they have uh, but I would like to emphasize that it's not any certain practice that makes them a regenerative farm. It's the compilation of all of it and how it fits together holistically. So really proud of them and what they've done so far. Uh, this picture behind me is actually from my first time going out and meeting the O'Crowleys. I was on a trip um, to learn more about orchard and vineyard production um, within California. And uh, uh, another friend of ours told us about the O'Crowleys. Uh, that morning um, and the next morning at 6 a.m. they were willing to accommodate me and show me around the orchard. Uh, they had actually been using some of our seed at that point, but um, yeah, it was great to get to meet them in person. And uh, so picture us having this conversation in their orchard with, um, with us, uh, like we've got behind me. Uh, so we're gonna get started with uh, just Zach and Monica sharing a little bit about their story, how they got to what they're doing now, and um, how they're changing their soil. Zach and Monica. All right. Well, thanks, Davis. Thank you very much, Davis and Jonathan. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Let me do this right. Okay, share. So just a little background on, on us to start with. Um, I grew up ranching and uh, studied economics in college and ended up in walnut and almond processing. So kind of in a management job, um, didn't do a lot on the farm, but Mike and I always wanted to go back to the farm. So this is kind of our, our dream. We've been uh, saving up for quite a few years to do this. And, and so it was, a, it was a big step for us, but one that we've been looking forward to for a long time. So there you go. I, I also grew up on a cattle ranch. Um, my family did uh, breeding stock. And, uh, and so, you know, agriculture was our thing. Almond farming was not necessarily, <laughs> but um, yeah. But I actually studied, uh, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts and do, and I'm an artist as such, but it's kind of, I went from being cowgirl to artist and then all of a sudden we're farming here. So California was in our plans originally, but it uh, is where he landed with his job. He actually, he's, he, he humbly put it, he's got a degree in economics. He loves numbers and it's a language for him, but he also has a degree in, uh, part of his degree is in mechanical engineering. And so he was like a natural fit for you know, processing, the processing world. And uh, so he's done an awful lot with almonds previously. So when we, we you know, got the opportunity to buy this farm, um, we lived right next to it for a few years and uh, we were excited, but we knew that it had like a lot of problems and we had never heard of regenerative farming. Um, we just, uh, I, I just wasn't thrilled with how almonds were farmed. But um, I'm going to I'm going to jump to the next picture so you can. See. Oh, OK. Um, so kind of give you a reference point. When you bought the farm, it had been farmed uh, conventionally for 40 to 50 years. Um, and, and when you farm almonds, one of the key uh, key concepts of farming almonds is you keep the ground completely bare because during harvest, the almonds get shaken onto the ground and then they're dried there. They're swept into windrows and picked up. And anytime you have vegetation, what it does is it hinders that sweeping and that collecting process. And so um, orchards are, are mowed and or chemically sprayed to where there's no ground cover. And our orchard was one of those that had absolutely no ground cover, it's completely bare, um, no topsoil. And uh, this is actually a picture of our neighbors. We didn't have a picture of ours or we, we lost a picture we had of ours, but this is the same exact way ours were looked in 2020. Uh, subsoil was extremely, extremely hard. There was no topsoil and uh, um, it, was a, it was a rough uh, start, but we actually started out thinking we're going to farm it conventionally, and then um, decided that you know what, after a little bit, we're going to we're going to go ahead and, and change because the uh, the first pallet that showed up of chemicals at our house, my wife was like, "Wow, 
this is not what we want. We're not doing this. And, and, so, and, so, and so I reminded her that I had a full-time job off the farm. Um, and we had a long discussion. And uh, what finally ended up happening was we started looking into organic practices. Um, and in our search for organic practices, um, one day I was I was watching YouTube videos, podcasts, well, all different on, things. I was a little bit disappointed in organic practices. Like all it felt to me like was is that the orchard, they did basically the same thing. We just switched which chemicals we use. And it just didn't feel like a healthy situation. Like it just didn't feel like we were putting in what, um, what, what like what was going to come out would be healthy. Like, and, and we, you know, people buy almonds because they're a healthy element. And, and it was, it was problematic to me that they were, that there was such a, and that we had so much bare ground that this ground should be doing more. We're watering the ground. Why don't we let what wants to, you know, like, why don't we let it grow? But because we're in the almond world, we completely understand that it was a requirement that we have to keep the ground bare at least once a year. And everybody told us, if you go organic, you have to make sure to keep the ground bare with, because your organic herbicides aren't as strong as what you can use that are not organic. And so don't let anything grow was, that was the keyword. Don't let anything grow if you're going to go organic or you'll never get on top of it again. Yep. So, okay. So in a lot of the research I was doing, I was looking at what we could use. And then uh, one day I was watching YouTube videos and came across a video by Gabe Brown. And he talked about these, the principles, not the practices, but the principles of regenerative agriculture. And all of a sudden the lights came on, all these practices that I've been studying fell into place. And we kind of um, we kind of took off from there. I walked out of that room, in fact, and I said, Monica, you know, I know, I figure out what we are. She was like, what are you talking about? What are we? Like, I didn't have any context for what he was talking about. Like, what are we? We're, we're regenerative. That's what we want to do. And these are the practices that these guys are doing. So um, so we immediately began to implement some of those practices. So I'm going to jump forward a couple slides here. So this is January 2021. So this is about nine months after we started um, and <laughs> started farming this orchard. You can see that we let the weeds grow. We actually did plant a fall cover crop that year, um, but the ground was so bad that it, it, it wouldn't grow. Um, no, 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 no. We planted, we planted the cover crop in the oh, spring. Thank you. Yeah, you're we right. We planted it in the spring. So before we'd ever heard what regenerative was, you know, we're like, well, let's dive in. Let's, let's put some ground cover in here. Like we didn't understand the principle of all the soil benefits of that, but the feeling was right. And more than that, though, we had talked to him and we were trying to solve our water infiltration problem. We were. See, our water infiltration was probably our number one biggest problem. Everybody else that bid against us to buy this orchard was going to tear it out because the trees were stunted, they weren't growing, the water wouldn't infiltrate, it would drown the trees. And um, and so we knew we couldn't afford to tear the trees out, but we kind of thought we could find a solution somehow. And so we had so many guys come and look at the orchard and get their opinion. Um, we even had somebody tell us to go get a one of those big deep, what do they call those tractors? A ripper. A ripper, yep. and just use it with one. With one shank, down there five feet. <laughs> the term. Rip the dry rows so that they could get the water to to, to drain down off the tree so they wouldn't drown through the, you know, through the compacted soil. Yeah. And then somebody else said, well, no, go in with a drill. You could just put drills periodically throughout the orchard, like drill holes that go down through the, the hard pan. And then the water could drain off of that. And um, it just seems so counterintuitive. Like we're watering the trees and we want the water to drain off. I thought we're all worried about losing water, but that was, that was a solution. Um, anyway, lots of suggestions. Somebody we talked to, our agronomist was like, oh, you got to put in one of those big tanks that puts acid in the soil that'll make, that'll force the soil to open up. And I was like, well, that, that kills a lot of soil life, whatever we want there. We knew we wanted, you know, that, but we didn't know to what extent it could be done. But then we talked to a gentleman that did a fish fertilizer and I had grown up using it. My dad had used it on our ranch growing up and, and, um, and I'd always respected it. And we'd use it on our gardens and we love to see the results. And so I called him. And I said, hey, you know, what could you, you know, tell us what these are, here's our problems. We'd love to use your product. Tell us about, you know, how this would fit. He couldn't sell it to us in California, but he was kind enough to spend a couple hours on the phone explaining soil exudates and all of these things and, and mycorrhizal fungi and things that were just totally new terms to us. And in the end, he said, I can't send you my product, but he said in the scriptures, in the Bible, God told the people that if they would allow whatever the earth on the seventh year to let the earth put forth whatever it wanted to, that that was a principle and that he suggested that for us. Now we were just a little bit stressed by that thought, like because the weeds that wanted to come were not pretty <laughs> and that wasn't the biggest issue, but they were pretty, I mean, they were ugly. But I was very nervous because of harvest, obviously. 
Um, being able to harvest with all the weeds was a, was a major problem, um, getting rid of them before harvest. Uh, but we did end up doing it. We ended up letting it grow. And we actually tried to plant cover crops, like I mentioned earlier, but um, at the beginning, yeah, most of them grow. wouldn't grow. But what did grow was weeds. So in the picture on the right, you can see um, there's actually an orchard in there. Mostly you can see the weeds, but there's an orchard in there. Uh, some of the some of the weeds were actually taller than the trees. Looked like looked okay. like you were in the Amazon jungle when you went to our orchard for a while there. Um, but uh, after that initial and we had to laugh, guys. Zach's work because he works in the almond industry. They would they would kind of go, hey hey, drove by your orchard the other day. They're yeah. like, uh, you need some help. <laughs> anyway, it was it had its moments. It, it still it did. Um, so after that initial crazy growth of, of all the, the annual weeds that were just trying to grow, um, it, it began to change. You saw the soil start to change. You saw the infiltration rates improve. And then this is another picture a year later, in April 2022. You can see there's a you know there's um, there's a lot of grass uh, in that picture and a lot less weeds. I mean you can see that there's um, the that mustard, mustard the mustard right front, center, but, but... but there's a lot more grasses that started to grow and a lot of the cover crops we planted after that really took hold and started doing a good job. So um, so and, once we got regenerative language, we understood that we were dealing with early succession plants. Like those early succession plants just came in in a fervor and they grew like I've never seen. I mean, we grew up with mallow. All of us hated it in the garden, right? That big old long root that grows on it. We had mallow that was taller than the trees. It was, we've got pictures of it two feet taller than Zach's head and he's over six foot. Like, you know, we're looking at like big weeds. I've never seen weeds grow like that before. So anyway, that they, was impressive. They, they grew really big. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm going to say. Um, so this was a year after we had started. This is actually, uh, I think the first cover crop we planted that actually did a good job of uh, germinating and taking off. Um, and you can see, we still don't have full coverage um you can see kind of down the center there that we have a little bit of bare ground but it, it really started to take off and grow and that and, and do better that bare ground we call it the snake here at the farm you can see that it kind of rolls and scrolls through the orchard and it's because the sprinklers are round of course and so it leaves this 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 serpentine line that runs down the middle of the orchard and it doesn't get any water any water and so in the winter time you know it, it even then it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't cross over. Like in the first year, it just stayed bare. It was so hard baked. It was so dead that it just, it maintains itself. And it even looked like we'd hedged it for a year. Once that cover crop got bigger, you know, it was just a super hard line that we designed into it. Anyway. So, so um, but we did, we did try to grow as much as we could that first, the first year. Um, not all of it came up, like I said, that we wanted to, but it did, a lot of it did come up eventually. Um, the other thing we did the first year is adding livestock. So we uh, we live in more of an urban area. Um, there's an airport nearby. There's a, a golf course on one side of us that borders us. And so we, we needed to have really good control of our animals. If we're going to do animals. And so we put a, a perimeter fence around our orchard. It was a little over two miles of fence. They put it in the fall of, of 2020. Um, and that's my wife and, and our daughter there unrolling the fence. Um, we, were, we were all part of the fence crew. And then we integrated the sheep. So the sheep we also integrated in the fall of 2020. And you can see the picture on the right. Uh, the sheep with the weeds. It, it wasn't pretty <laughs> at all, um, but it got the job done. Um, and we learned a lot those first few months of, of dealing with sheep. We both grew up with livestock. So actually, livestock was easier to deal with than, than the trees from our perspective, but um, it was still challenging in that environment. What was hard too, though, was is that we called so many people. Like I just, I, I, I talked to people from one end of the valley to the other and all over the country um, searching for has anybody done this? Has anybody used sheep in the orchard? What's that like? What does this look like? And we did find that there were some people that did use sheep, but they used them as a kill step. So what they would do is they would bring them in at the end of summer or like, well, not the end of summer, in the spring after they'd mowed or whatever else. And they would use those sheep to come in and graze down hard and kill plants so that then, um, then it was more prepared for harvest. And it was not really for manure. It wasn't for... It, 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 mostly it was a kill step. And so that wasn't what we wanted. And we knew that we wanted it more like pasture. And of course, then once we learned from Gabe Brown, we knew exactly what we wanted. We wanted it to be, you know, to be grazing it um, well, but, uh, but that was interesting. We searched, this was another element of part of our journey was we searched, we went all over the country to find the right sheep. Um, and that was probably my background with genetics and animals, but um, the, we, we, we chose the Katahdin because they're a hair sheep and we didn't, wool sheep tend to be more prone to chew on the trees. They're browsier. Um, but the Katahdin, 
um, you know, it was going to shut off. It was one less job we had to do, but it also um, has a natural parasite resistance. And for those who aren't as familiar with sheep as we are now, but we weren't then, P parasites are a huge killer in sheep and they use a lot of parasitoids for sheep. And we didn't want that in our soil. And so we we chose sheep that, and we continue to select hard for sheep that show the parasite resistant genes and genetics so that we can, um, so we don't, we don't have that. And if a sheep has parasites, that's how it gets cold, it's out. Yeah. So that is that is an element that was big for us, or is big for yeah, us. I, I would say that, yeah, I would say the biggest challenges we had starting off were um, the water infiltration. We talked about this earlier, the really come back to ground. But the second one was how do we how do we make or enable ourselves to grow this cover crop year round? Because during the summertime, when you have to clean off the orchard floor, it, it becomes bare. Um, and so we began to research for harvest. For yeah. harvest. So we began to research how can we harvest without letting the elements touch the ground. And and my brother. As an engineer, we began actually to design a machine um, together. But after a while, we found a machine that we were able to retrofit that would um, that would catch the almonds in an apron and and not let them hit the ground. And so we, we now are able to harvest without touching the ground, which means we're able to grow cover crop year round and graze year round. And so that to us was one of the biggest um, one of the biggest challenges to overcome in the almond industry because that's not done anyone else in the almond industry and uh so most people that are doing almonds you hire a, a harvesting company to come in you know sweep and shake and do all of that kind of stuff and so it, this was kind of not <laughs> it's not normal yeah. <laughs> i don't to say that it's not normal so so in 2021 we had to mow everything off um that was our first year i'm sorry in 2020 um we mowed everything off that was our first year of of uh harvest and we didn't have our system in in place yet and so it was a really challenging harvest um, and this next picture I'm going to show you, uh, this is actually 2022, um, but 2021 was, was, uh, high vegetation as well. So this is what our orchard looked like last year during harvest. You can see my wife there and, and some of that, um, that's, that that's the green grasses. cover seed cro cover crop right there. Yep. And you see some of that, some of that, uh, vegetation is, you know, eight feet tall. Um, and that was awesome because our best growing season is the summer, which is also, and again, in the almond industry, the, the time when you make it bare. So to able, for us to be able to allow that vegetation to grow and allow the cover crops to grow was was the best way we can capture sunlight and carbon and build our organic matter. So we felt like we had arrived when we finally got the harvester and and uh, and were able to harvest above the ground without having to take off the cover crop. It, it was so, a game changer. So we're going to jump over now. Uh, we, so we told you a little bit of our story. We're going to jump over now some of the some of the data. And uh, what was nice is right when we started off, Ecdysis contacted us, uh, Jonathan Lundgren, for those of you who are familiar with him, and, and asked us to be part of a study. And what they did was they took, I think it was 30 or 40 almond orchards, and each year they go and they take samples from the orchard and they analyze um, organic matter levels, the percent living ground cover, water infiltration rate, and there's a few other variables as well that they analyze. So we wanted to share with you um, some of the results of that over the last three years. So to start off with, um, we have a neighbor Right next to us that we're using as a control that is conventional so he's part of the study he's just yep. the one that is the most you know they they as we asked around they found the one with the most similar soil to us and similar you practices, know practices similar environment well not so, practices but. so we don't have his organic matter from um from 2020 but we have ours so we were at 0.72 percent organic matter in 2020 very low that's why our ground was hard as concrete but um you can see over the last three years we've actually gained um about 0.6% organic matter, um, up to 1.3%. And we're actually now matching our neighbor who, the orchard that our neighbor has is about four years old and it was not in almonds before that, it was in a different crop. Um, and so the ground has not been abused as bad, but um, it's it was kind of fun this year because we're actually now at the same level of organic matter as our neighbor. Well, it's sad though, because we're years. seeing his trend going down as all of the nitrogen that you use for almonds, as they push these trees really hard, it burns up all of that organic matter in the soil. And we're seeing his trend go down to reach where ours used to be, right? <laughs> and as we watch ours climb up, it's exciting. It's yeah. really exciting. So that gives you a little background for this next graph. So um, so this next graph shows in the study, they broke everyone, in, they broke the, the farms into three groups. One was conventional, just regular farming. Uh, like the our second, neighbor. Yep. The second was regenerative, which meant that they had defined nine practices, and and these farms had to have implemented five of the practices for more than four years, um, and then transitional, which meant that they were implementing five or more of the practices but less than four years, 
And and then on the far right, they gave us the results of our farm compared to them. And so you can see in the so graph, we, we would fit in the transitional group. Yeah, we would be in the transitional but... group. Thank you. Yeah. And, and on the graph, you can see that, you know, our organic matter levels are lower than all others groups in the graph. Um, but keep in mind that we we basically doubled from the last three years. And so um, it's the positive trend. But this kind of sets us up for where we're going um, next. Um, and that is our water infiltration rate. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, basically what we do is we pound a six inch ring into the ground and we pour the equivalent of one inch of rainwater into the ring and see how long it takes to infiltrate into the soil. And soil that has good organic matter, that has um, uh, higher fungal properties, that has uh, the pores that are open, roots, it will infiltrate much faster than collapsed and hard soil. And so uh, they can they can time that and they can rank that. And so this graph right here, same groups um, in 2020, you can see ours was almost nothing, almost wouldn't go in at all. Um, and again, it was, it was as hard as concrete. In fact, I want to share one other thing real quick. When we were doing the sheep fence in our farm the first year, oh. I literally had to go. No, not, the, not the perimeter fence, but like the rotational oh, grazing, the paddock fences. Yeah. I literally had to go out with a hammer and pound a nail into the ground and then pull the nail out and then pound the post in the ground with a hammer to get them to go in. That's how hard the ground was. You guys, it, it was so terrible. It, was, it was enough to be like, this is not a good idea. And it was my idea to have sheep. I was like, I don't think this is a good idea. After so many times of, I mean, we're just out there walking around with these big old spikes and using like, you know, dead blow hammers to like sit there and pound them into the ground and trying to get those things in there. And then, and then you still have to put up the fence. But we literally, we were, it was bad. It was really bad. So uh, very compacted soil. Um, and, uh, and so this was 2020. Okay, and then I'm going to show you now 2023. So this is 2023. You can see uh, we went from, you know, point, point zero, zero one, you know, very, very low infiltration right now to we're at 2.2 as of last year. Now, this isn't us doing the test either. We've had actually two third-party groups do this test. Yep. Um, which is really interesting to me because, three. I, again, our organic matter levels are still lower than than all of these other groups. Um and so what is it that's driving that? Uh, when I first got these graphs back, I was kind of shocked um, because of such the because of such a massive difference in the infiltration rate. I thought, why in the world is our sub so much better than everybody else's when our organic matter levels are lower, our health scores are lower? Um, what's driving this? You know, what's driving this? And uh, and so um, uh, as we looked at the graphs and really contemplated what we we're looking at, this is what we came to to realize. We have living ground cover, almost 100% living ground cover. The regenerative orchards, on average, have about just a little under 50%. Conventional, you know, maybe 8%, transitional, 26% or something. And that's for what percentage <clears throat> of the year? And they do this test in February, right after, right after the winter winter rains have come through. And so that's the best time to capture, you know, that data. But during the summer, if you looked at this graph and did it again, you would see that all these these three groups have basically 0% living ground cover during the summer months. And so not only do we have a greater percentage, but we have a greater percentage for more of the year, for, for all year. Um, and that was what we feel like is driving this graph right here, the ability to infiltrate water, which was, again, one of our biggest issues when we started out. So we've been... We really feel like, honestly, like following that advice to let the earth put forth what it wanted to, and that those early succession plants you know, those big old roots that they wanted to put out, they were all part of that or that soil changing and fixing this problem. I mean, this was a problem that was going to tear a, an orchard out and that made the ground less valuable around here and everything else. And it was a problem that 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 the earth really did fix. Like it, it solved the problem. And by just letting the earth do what it's good at and staying covered and following these principles, it solved this problem without the acid without the holes drilled without the ripping <laughs> and and it just is this has been this has been one of those things that is as is, is a joy to remind us that this is working and that it's doing what it needs to do and we've seen the trees as as we've gone through this journey we've seen the trees re, you know react very strongly um whereas they were very stunted extremely low growth each year the years before um in some areas our trees actually were always yellow when we first bought it they would never turn green um they literally all turn green now. And, and that was, I think by the second year, they were all green. And we're um, not adding nitrates. No, we're not adding nitrates yet. And and uh, the growth was just phenomenal. I mean, a lot of the trees had three three feet of, of growth the first year, 
free feed growth the second year. Some of the trees have literally tripled in size in the last three years because they were just, they're almost like little bushes when we first got them. Uh, but all of a sudden they just took off. And so it's been really neat to see the growth. So Davis, that's kind of our presentation. So we're going to pass it back to you. To give you context of where we've come from, what we're doing here a little bit. Outstanding. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, so you've, you've obviously changed the soil quite a bit, and I would say that's over a short amount of time. So these continued practices, it's going to be amazing, I think, the change that you'll see over a 10-year span, for instance. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what you've observed with the trees, um, uh, cover cropping being what I usually define as what you grow in between cash crops, which could be either in between in the calendar year or literally in between the rows of the cash crop. Um, so thinking of uh, what what the um, bread and butter of the operation is, although I don't think there's quite a, <laughs> uh, this is an almond orchard. How are the almonds doing? So the almonds, uh, when you first bought the orchard, were producing about a quarter of what they should have been at that age. Um, and they, they actually, we bought it when it should have been just in the prime of production. Um, it was really low. And, uh, and they and held on for a few years knowing that it had been struggling and they finally were just like done. Like this has yeah. got to go. So we saw the first year um, of good increase in production. Just right off the gate, we saw a really good increase in production. Actually almost with, doubled. With less of the fertilizer inputs and okay. like it, it, we, yeah. you know, like that stuff all that, that all changed. So that was really fun to watch that the, the it orchard changed. respond so much. And, right. like it really did. and then, as we mentioned before, the trees, you can see it in the trees where there's much, much larger growth. I mean, way, way more, way more growth. And then the, the, um, the leaves are greener they're deeper green than they were. And some of them literally were just yellow when they first started. Um, and they would see that way all year long. In fact, one of the um, one of the guys used to work here. He came back and helped us uh, last summer, and he was just super surprised. He came up to me, he's like, "Holy smokes, this tree! I've I've never seen it green, um, and it's green now." Said, yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? And uh, and so you see the change in the trees. The last two years have been really low production, almost back to where it was originally. Um, there are some reasons for that. One is uh, we had the sheep uh, eat up a lot of the trees <laughs> the first year. And the harvester that we bought, we had to trim up a lot of the trees. And so we actually removed a lot of the actual bearing fruit wood on the trees. Um, and then this last year, we had- And that was a sacrifice wood. that we were aware of and were okay with. Yeah. Um, it has been, an, I just have to add this in here really fast. It has been an interesting trade though. See, on those trees, a lot of guys grow them with just maybe a two foot trunk. And then it's just all branching out from there. And you get a lot of low hanging branches and stuff like that. And, um, you know- the harvester though because of the, the the catch aprons it it has to have it up a little higher so we did a bunch of trimming and then the sheep you know they love the leaves and they love the almonds when they can reach them that's a it's a truth and so um you know it's we laugh because here's our orchard with all of this undergrowth right and everybody else's is neat and trim and perfect you know there's nothing growing but then during blossom, especially, you've got this hard white line underneath our trees where the sheep have eaten everything off that they can reach. And it's just like the super duper, like we've trimmed or hedged about, the whole thing. It's about four or five feet tall. It's right there. Just <laughs> perfect line. It's just this perfect line. But on some of these little short trees, it was literally half of our tree. And it was, we accepted it. Our trees are growing. This is part of the sacrifice to do it the way we feel like it needs to be done. And um and we've seen the trees really respond. I mean, they yeah. have really grown, but it has taken its toll on, you know, on the yield, on the yield, okay. but, on, but on the, on the tree health, it is, they are, they have, I mean, I don't even know how to describe how much they've improved every year. This is a, this is an Many example. Times improvement. every year before that. And the years before that, if you look at the records, even before we owned it, they had to apply zinc every year. You're better at explaining this with numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they had to apply zinc every year. We applied zinc our very first year, but after that we tested and, and there was no need to. Um, and, and it wasn't just zinc, it was a lot of other things too that we realized we didn't need to apply anymore. But it's opening up uh, in the soil and the trees can get it. Yeah, and that's and exciting. Um, and then last year, um, I mean, most of you know, but we had a really rough winter season. Uh, bloom happens in February. And that was right during all those really, really heavy rain events and so we had very very few hours of pollination and so we didn't get a good pollination last year 
Uh, so we didn't have a very good crop this year either. Uh, so we're hoping for a great crop next year. There's always another year, right? That's what farmers say. <laughs> and we're excited to see what happens. No, we we really, Davis, without a doubt, we feel like our trees are healthier. They are better. They are doing well. Um, it's just been hard farm years. But um, I think one of the greatest challenges in that, though, is, is that because we're not farming the way that is set up for the system, um, we went in, we looked at getting insurance when we first started, but no insurance is offered to those who don't follow certain practices. And we're like, well, that's not us. And we're not going to follow those practices. So that's, that's part of our, our challenge that way. But I, I absolutely, without a doubt, the, the health of our orchards has increased. Our trees are healthy and happy. They're thriving. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've got one question that I think will take a, a bit of time, but I want to get to our Q and a here before too long. That's already starting to fill up. Um, the question is, as you started to uh, look at what does almond production normally look like, and then you were inspired by the Gabe Brown video and learning of this new way, how did you come up with what is the system that we can create? How, how do we apply those principles to our orchard? But I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it, a growing season and um, what you can take on as a couple. I mean, the, the time that goes into um, adding more livestock species or uh, building more fence or all of these things, as you tried to figure out what is the system that we can build uh, that not only produces um, the best trees, but um, fits your family and uh, what you're interested in. Talk, walk us through that a little bit. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of funny because we, we feel like we've actually grown together as a couple as we've made a lot of these decisions and had to talk through a lot of those, like those challenges, right? I mean, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of options, a lot of options, a lot of things we could do, things we disagreed on, things we agreed on. And so it was actually, a, it's been a great strengthening of our marriage because of that. Um, but and it's the I, best way to raise kids. They're solving real world problems and mm -hmm. it's good. I, I think I, if I'm understanding your question, right, Davis, the, how did we come up with the system? Like what was our process of coming up with the system that works for our farm? Um, you know, identifying the things that were holding us back. He was good at that and his engineering, he applied it and he figured out how we could get, you know, we did that harvester. We both worked on it yeah. and uh, we continue the, to work the, on it. The first year, year and a half, as we talked about all these practices, we just kept coming back to the same thing over and over and over again. And that was, we really can't make good progress on this unless we figure out how to harvest without shaking the, the almonds onto the ground because we, it ruins our sheet program. It ruins our cover crop program, it ruins the um, the movement forward of the, of the, the, the carbon, the soil, uh, the whole nine yards. And so we just, we guys were stuck on that and we kept coming back to it over and over and over again. And um, and so when we finally figured that piece out, I feel like that was a huge milestone in our journey. Um, the, it was honestly, an enabler. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was. Honestly, the sheep weren't, I mean, I didn't feel like we had a lot of extra time. That was probably the biggest challenge, <laughs> but, but the sheep weren't nearly as as challenging to us because we both grew up ranching around animals um, as the harvester was. But uh, that's true. But and one other thing, though, I mean, Davis, we um, I, I even saw on your Instagram the other day that you were talking about, you know, you guys are experimenting to see what fits you guys. Um, and it just brought back all of these thoughts that in 2020, we labeled it our experimental year. Yep. And the goal was is to try everything <laughs> that was nuts just by the way we've been around our trees so long. but we we literally we tried i think 35 different breeds of chickens and we tried chicken tractors we tried fences for chickens we did turkeys we tried 12 different breeds of turkeys we tried um we got pigs to try in the orchard um we got geese we had ducks cows we tried cows. We got smaller cows. We tried the Dexter cows in the orchard. We were like, what's going to work? What's going to fit? What, what blows? You know, we had that we got in the sheep in the fall of 2020 and that was still part of the experiment. We tried different types of fence. Um, we were just like all in, like we are all in, but like, it was like the all in year of like, okay, give it a blast, see what happens. And then yeah. be like, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and, and, and we knew up front that a lot of them wouldn't, we didn't know that they would work, but we knew that if by percentage, a lot of them probably weren't going to work. Um, and we were okay with that. We were fine with the, with the fact that, Hey, we're going to fail at these 80%, but the 20% that we do have left are going to work. Yep. And that's what we need to figure yep. out. Right. Yep. And, and a lot of it was also networking. We talked to a lot of people, watched a lot of YouTube videos, 
Uh, I feel like I, I took several university classes worth of the equivalent of, of YouTube videos, podcasts, webinars, books, uh, you know, a lot of research. You even, you even went through um, the, like, um, there was educational one that you even paid for yep. that was like, I mean, we, we did all kinds of things that were, that were helpful to learn that year. But I think, I mean, it was, it was just fun. I mean, honestly, like you can ask my kids, they can tell you what chickens thrive best in our orchard. They can tell you what breed does it and what color of egg they lay too. I mean, it's been, it's been fun. It's been an adventure. We've, we've pulled back, we've looked at it and said, okay, now for our energy, what can we manage? What really fits the orchard? Well, what, what is helpful. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've cut back on some chickens. They did well. Were they worth it for our time? We are really short on time. He works a very full-time job that's very demanding. We've got kids, we homeschool, we are, we are, um, we are, hey, hey. <laughs> we got kids coming in right now. But, um, but I'm not, you it sounds like you just went all yeah. in on the system and, and here are the principles and we're going to try as many of these principles as we can incorporate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It was and and find out what we like. I mean, my kids have an opinion on chicken breeds and geese breeds and turkeys and and it's been it's been good. And there's things that we will go back and do again, but then we recognize they're like, oh, we need a different infrastructure for this to make that thrive with this. Um, the pigs have been a hilarious part of the adventure. We actually very much like them and you know, in searching for a market for them because they're unique, we're we're either we're looking at expanding or retracting, but they're helpful in the orchard system. I think some of the things too that we had to think through was was scale, right? Mm -hmm. our, our almond orchard is not a small almond orchard. It's not a massive commercial almond orchard. I mean, it's not thousands of acres, but it's also not ten or twenty acres. Um, you know, it's it's sixty four acres. It's big enough so, to get in trouble on. Exactly, it's big enough to get in trouble on. So so we had to think of okay, what can we actually manage and and how can we make this more efficient and um, you know, my, my, one of the challenges we had was putting up sheep fence and taking it down as we move sheep each day. And, um, and our oldest son is 12 and, and we have made it a, a game to see how fast we could time ourselves in putting up and taking down the sheep fence. And so we time ourselves each time and our record for taking down a quarter mile sheep fence and putting up a quarter mile, which is what we do each time is 23 minutes and 32 seconds. Right. And so it's just, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's the challenge of trying to make things efficient enough that we can manage them. Sure. So and, and reaching the scale. But, yeah, that's excellent. Well, I think we'll get into a Q and A. We've got uh, 15 questions in here already. I think one of the ones that will uh, be be important to cover right away. Do you have a picture, Zach, of the harvesting equipment? Um, I do, and I could actually share that. I don't have it on the this this presentation, but I could share that with you and with Jonathan, so you could post it after the the, the video. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and just to take a stab at describing uh, it, and you've done that a little bit already, but normally you've got something that comes in through these rows behind me, grabs the tree, yeah. shakes it, then that's all swept into the middle and something comes and picks up all of that, uh, that swath of almonds. This instead is almost like an under uh, or it's like an upside down umbrella. Inverted, yeah, like that's exactly what I was going to say. An umbrella that wraps around the tree, then the tree is shaken and those nuts all fall into that funnel and are collected right there, um, all above ground. Uh, am I describing that right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I would say that, you know, half the machine, the machine that wraps, the part that wraps around the tree is is kind of like a half of an umbrella. Um, and then the other half is the machine itself, which has got some conveyors on it. So as the, as the nuts slide down the tarps to the conveyors, they get collected. And then we we tried it out with bins the first year. We were using um, four foot by four foot by two foot bins. We're actually going into those and we were just dropping those on the ground behind the harvester and then picking them up later. Um, and we realized that was a lot of work, a lot of handling. And so we modified it again and uh, and we're he, going into trailers very now. cleverly. He got a different conveyor and we, we keep collecting old equipment. You know, you're really into farming when you collect old equipment. <laughs> so we he puts them into a nut cart on the back and then he drops them at the end of the rows. And then I, this is part of the plan too, is that we didn't want to keep making more passes through through our rows. We didn't yeah. want the compaction. And so he drives through it once. And then I pick up with the tractor on the outside the cart and I go in and empty it into the trailers. So I, I think just to touch on what she just said too, brought up another thing, another good point. Typically in an almond orchard, 
you have between 20 and 25 passes with heavy equipment a year um, between the sprays, you know, the herbicides, the fungicides, um, ant bait, the mowing, the harvest. The harvest actually alone is five passes um, with the, with normal equipment. And so, um, so there's a lot of passes. In our orchard, we literally drive down each row one time each year with the harvester and that's it. And so we, we reduce, do, except for with our cover crops. I'm so sorry. We, yeah. We, when we we're doing do cover, cover, yep, the I'm cover sorry, crop is our one right. other so, pass. It would be, yeah, two, actually two or three passes. You're, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, just, that. I really wanted to make sure, hopefully people can picture the system that we're talking about, the harvesting system, because I think it's really important that uh, as we think about how, how does regenerative ag grow or how do I uh, try this out on, on my farm, we think about, well, I want to do this, but I can't do that because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. But what you did was you didn't start with changing here. You went back to here and we're going to change this to allow us to do all these other things. That's the harvesting equipment. Uh, you changed that and it allowed you, I mean, it just completely opened the playbook. Um, Kelly Mulville at Picenas Ranch, um, who's taught me a lot about perennial crops and how this uh, regenerative system fits within that, talked about sometimes uh, you can't just apply a regenerative principle to your system and expect it to work. Sometimes you have to redesign the system uh, and that's what you guys did. And it's just, uh, yeah, really cool how much that opened up for you. Kelly is amazing. He was one of the most encouraging people that we talked to. He was he was the one person you. that was like, well, I don't know what it'd be like in almond orchards, but go for it. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I only need that much. <laughs> you know? Yep, I love anyway, it. Kelly's awesome. Yes. So uh, now to work through the list a little bit. Um, when you seeded the cover crop, and I love, personally, I love that you guys started with just letting things go. Uh, just, I, I think it's a, a beautiful concept of just like, okay, open hands, we're gonna see what happens with this, with the natural vegetation that came in. And uh, my wife makes fun of me for the books that I uh, get and that I <laughs> spend money on, um, uh, <laughs> on something that looks like a um, book report. Um, but when weeds talk, man they were talking in that orchard and i mean they were talking loudly the mallow that came in or malva um uh, with those with those tap roots that was trying so hard to open up this is what this is what the soil needs and it's these indicator species that came in um and then the uh, succession that happened from there really just a beautiful thing but when you start to go to cover crops uh did you or um, using your irrigation schedule in the dry season where things kind of crisped up and up that you can just go right in? No, we had to, so it's kind of funny because the sheep ate a lot of the, the malva weeds, uh, leaves off, but they left these huge stalks. That first just, fall. Just, yeah, just dead stalks, but super tall dead stalks. And so we went in and mowed it. Okay. First time. You uh, guys, this is funny, but when they came and ate them, those 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 mallow, like, I mean, they're, they had they were like young trees. and you know, there's stocks for that and the sheep would eat all the leaves off, but then you drive over it with like the mule or, you know, whatever you drive through that. And it sounded like, like you were going through like one of those car washes that just like, like this, you know, because they're just beating the underside of your thing with like, it's just these plain old stocks. It was crazy. So they were just up, but they, the interesting thing is, and this is one of the things I love, they didn't come back. We mowed them off and we'd mowed them off all through harvest, trying to get ahead of the weeds because we were in so much trouble with trying to harvest that year without our harvester yet. Um, but this time after the sheep grazed them, they didn't come back. Yeah. In fact, Incredible. we haven't seen hardly any of it in our orchard until this last year and we flooded. And since the flood, we've seen different things come yeah. at parts of the orchard, which has been interesting to watch that. But um, but the Malvo came back this year, but we hadn't seen it for two years. And you can't tell me that the seed bank wasn't there because I promise you it right, was. Right, right. <laughs> so, so I just skipped back to this picture. Uh, this, we did mow... This was the last time we mowed. Yeah, this was the last time we mowed. We mowed and uh, and then planted this. So yeah, we did need to mow. Um, if you got too much, what we've learned is if you got too much dead vegetation above the ground and the 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 seed can't germinate and get the sunlight very easy, then it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna grow very well. And so yeah, you kind of got to get it knocked down. I I think going back, if we had the ability to to do a roller crimper or something like that, where we just laid it down instead of instead of you know 
uh, grounded up more, we would have done that. Um, but yeah, I, I think you, you need to do something in order to get soy to seal, seed to soil contact and then also sunlight readily right. available to seed sprouts. So absolutely. Yeah. But that was the last time that we mowed. Yeah. We haven't mowed sure. for a couple of years. But yeah, so the sheep we, the sheep will go through and graze and then we will put in a, you know. Yeah. The so that was the initial we had to do that after that. No till drill. After that, we've no till drilled into into just a regular field and or into the regular orchard. It's been fine. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about pollination? Uh, that's a that's a big deal in almond production, uh, and how pollination might be a little bit different in your system than the typical system. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, part of our 2021 we're experimenting, we got our own bees. And that was cool. Okay. We tried it um, and that we thought that was a great plan and it was more than we could keep up with. Um, the ones that have survived us though, those are stock to be reckoned with, but <laughs> we, you know, we we scaled it back. We're like, okay, we'll provide bees for this part of the orchard. We still have to get bees for the other part of the orchard. Yeah. What we have seen is there's an awful lot of natural pollinators um, that have come into the orchard, you know, lacewings and ladybugs and, um, I don't know what else, but there's a lot, there's a lot more bugs. I guess here's one other example. At the DISA study in a conventional orchard, um, they calculate that there's 40,000 bugs per acre. Um, and when they did ours, and this was two years ago when they told us mm -hmm. this, but um, they calculated 5 million bugs per acre. And so, you know, a lot more bugs per acre. We definitely, and, and we see them. And so when we did plant cover crops, um, in, intentionally with a lot of flowers to attract the, the beneficial insects and the, and the pollinators. So, yeah. Yeah. And one thing with that, like there, there's a couple of factors, especially for almonds. Almonds bloom. They're the first thing to bloom, really. There's only a few other plants that will bloom ahead of them here. And so a lot of our pollinators that are nat they're nat native or whatever you want to call it to our orchard, they're not active yet. And so that is still an issue for us. Mm -hmm. um, we can't count on them being a huge part of it. A lot of people told us, rule of thumb, organic orchards, they said, can sometimes get away with half as many bees um, because of all of the natural pollinators that are there. Um, that's, I think that there's some truth to it. I think that um, you're taking a bigger risk, though, just like with the bad year that we had last year. Um, where you just your bees just couldn't get to enough places fast enough because of the weather. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question well or not. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So you are bringing in bees uh, from outside sources. I was curious if you had tried honey in your own bees. Yeah. We're, no, we, we have tried our have... own bees, and the goal is to eventually be there where we have, no pun intended, to have all of our own bees. But, cool. um, you know, in the meantime, you know, we're, we're raising up the stock that will survive us as handlers <laughs> or our system best the ones that really thrive here with the least amount of intervention yeah. because we really don't want um we don't need another huge project yeah yeah and just like in the orchard there's an awful lot of sprays and um i mean not our orchard. Wor wormer, i know but what i'm saying is in, in the bee industry there's an awful lot of antibiotics and sprays and things you can get into in hives and we don't want any of that either right mm -hmm. so we're trying to raise um seed stock of bees if you will that don't require those those things and that so don't need so the selected. mite treatments and stuff like that and yeah. we've definitely selected very hard natural selection <laughs> has been at play so speaking of selection um a question a little bit further down here mike rice um was asking what cover crop makes you've used and i'm curious uh we talked about the benefit that some of those early succession weeds were providing for you and then we talked a little bit about pollination um so as we think about um uh, selecting for plants that you uh, want to be there instead of uh, just what might have appeared initially. Um, what are you selecting for? What what plants do you want out there? Um, and what factors are you evaluating for that? You know, good question. That's a great question. I think uh, the number one thing you want is high diversity, um, just to, to help the system be, to grow together. Um, we actually went through the green cover seed uh, online portal and you spent days literally days going over all we, the seeds um reading up all the seeds we and made our end, own end, excel spreadsheets of like this one will do this and trying to keep track of it yeah. in our heads and you know and, and at the end we're like around. holy smokes this is so much information we should call somebody and talk to them because it's it's a lot of it's a lot to digest right 
Um, Cause they're like, oh yeah, we want that, but we also want this, but we also want this. Um, but the fun thing is I, when you work with green cover season that you don't have to pick and choose, they just give it all to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, more diversity, go for it. <laughs> yeah. I, but which ones thrive at the right season that you're planting it is where we kind of got ourselves into, you know, yeah. over our heads. Sure. Um, but I think I think for sure diversity was high on our list. We wanted again, we wanted plants that would uh, produce flowers for our bees. Um, can I we, can I take that and go back to the last question? The thing about pollinators that's been really fascinating is is that a lot of places you can order like uh, like um, beneficial insects that will eat your bad bugs, right? Mm -hmm. And but the problem is is that they will you'll get this huge population that you buy that will knock down this bad population, but then of course your good population dies off because there's no food for it. Right. So the key, though, of what we've been trying to kind of get to is, is that if I don't want a big, bad population to keep my good bugs alive because I don't really want to keep growing. I want those guys gone. But beneficial insects will eat pollen. And so if they have a diet of pollen, they will be living here. And then when the opportunity to be a predator bug is there, they will eat that. And so if we will have a lot of flowers in our orchard, we will maintain our beneficial insect population without having to have a lot of nasty bugs for them to eat. If that made any sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we plant things that will flower. We want yeah. flowers growing in the orchard all the time. And on my Instagram, I'll oftentimes, I think people probably are like, what in the world? Why does she care about how many flowers are of it? But like, I like to go through and just take pictures of everything that's blooming at any one given point of time and be like, oh, look, we've got this, 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 and this. And even when everybody else is saying it's a dearth in our area, we've got 10 different species that are still blooming in the orchard, yeah. which is awesome. Right. I, I think one other, I think, thing to add to that is that we first talked about doing a lot of, of legumes for the nitrate fixation and, um, you know, and this and that and the other. And I guess what I really come back to is uh, try to kind of mimic what nature does. And in nature, nature doesn't have a high percentage of, of legumes in the mixes. Um, you know, there's a lot of grasses, there's a lot of flowering plants, there's some broad leaves uh, and there's some legumes, but, having that diversity is what really felt like at the end of the day was most important. Um, and then warm season versus cool season, annuals versus perennials, right? Those are all discussions that, that we had to have, but um, but kind of the overarching thing I think was keeping it very diverse um, each season. Right. So. There's seasons, Davis, that it feels like a flower garden out there and I hate seeing the sheep eat it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it seems like you're keeping some happy sheep. Uh, they are uh, very busy. Uh, by the way, the sheep, are you having to move them out of the orchard during harvest, or are you able to just set up a paddock in this corner while you're harvesting the rest and uh, just keep them within the orchard? That's a great question. <laughs> that was another big question that we had to, had to figure out. Yeah, that was a long, that's been a long time coming. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, just to answer it briefly, because I know we're getting short on time, but we actually decided um, and we figured out that during harvest, um, we will graze them through part that we're not harvesting because they're a real pain to have around. They're not a problem because that we, we've got organic certification, all of that, even with it, it's all approved. Um, but because the, the, we never touch the ground with our product. So we have them in the part we haven't got to yet. And then once we're done grazing that, the goal is to have a certain portion of our orchard harvested to the point that we take the sheep off. We put them, because we're, do a sheep, the, we're a part of NSIP, which is the National Sheep Improvement Program where we're breeding for selected qualities like the parasite resistance and good mothering and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, we breed them up in groups. So we have them in pens, which is the only time we feed hay. We breed them up in pens. And then when we're done with harvest, they're done with breeding and we put them back out on the orchard and they're out there. Yeah. So we've tried to make our system work with, we've got multiple systems stacking up here and we're trying to get them where they, where they marry. <laughs> that makes sense. So, and that was another thing about the Katahdin sheep is it's super flexible with its fertility that it will breed up throughout the year. So. Sure. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. And I think we've got about, um, if you're okay with going over just a little bit, maybe we'll take another uh, five or 10 minutes for questions. Uh, you can say no to that, by the way. No, that's no, fine. Totally fine. Okay. Um, I'm curious, maybe to hopefully summarize some of these questions, and maybe there will be something to glean from um, however you answer this uh, that will address a lot of different things. What What do you think, um, recognizing that we have listeners from all sorts of different systems and all sorts of different locations, uh, what do you want people to learn from your system 
and how might it apply to apply to them? Mm, that's a great question. I, I, I feel like you, you, you mentioned lots of different listeners from different areas, different systems. And again, I, I go back to context, which is one of the principles, right? What's your context? Um, and I, I guess I think that if none of these practices apply to you, all of these principles do apply to you. And um, so you just got to figure out what practices will fulfill the principles that you need to follow in your area and in your system. And kind of what you talked about earlier with the harvester, that was in our system, that was a deal breaker. We had to figure that out. Right. And that would allow us then to implement all these other practices, all these other principles that we wanted to. So um, I think that's one thing. And then I think the other thing that I would just say is that sometimes uh, for us, at least, we try to go too fast, too much, too fast. Um, and so which is great in some things, but not so great in other things. And so I guess sometimes pulling your ideas back and saying, OK, I'm going to try this, but I'm only going to try 50 percent of these ideas instead of 100 percent of the ideas and managing it closer, I think uh, sometimes is better than than doing it all at once so i'm his idea tank i'm the one that comes up with the crazy ideas um he so he's saying manage his wife is what he's saying he's <laughs> i'm just kidding but no i think i mean zach said it really really well i one thing i'd add to that is honestly like and i um these principles i mean we came to them like we told you from a personal space they came to us as like a gift all of a sudden on top of something that we were already being led to um, and that we had already discovered to a certain point we felt. And I guess that, um, you know, if you're willing to, to put your, your time in and your work in um, and you are seeking truth, it works out. Mm -hmm. And, and we keep holding on to that because there's still things that were working out. Um, but I really believe as we gave thanks for each of those weeds that were willing to grow in our poor soil, as scary as those weeds were to the system that was already established, it was part of our journey of knowing that, you know, and helping us discover that point that we had to change like the harvester. And I guess that, you know, if we give thanks for those um, and instead of trying to fight nature, we we learned to make it our friend, I guess, a little bit. That sounds kind of cliche, but but really those the, the earth knew what it needed to fix the problem. And we spur that along with adding the diversity in and directing it to fit our system the way we want it to by adding the different seeds and the different flowering plants that we want to establish in the orchard over time. But I think that accepting it and just um, uh, it, it, maybe embracing it, maybe embracing the the fact that the earth does wonderful things and, and trust it a little bit, you know, yeah. that it's going to, that it can fix these problems. Right. And I guess the point I made earlier, and I want to make it one more time, is that to me, going back to this last graph I shared, living ground cover. I mean, living ground cover is the difference between us and all these other orchards that are being studied and um, and having it as much time as possible throughout the entire year is really critical. I mean, the sheep, the reason that we graze is because we're trying to stimulate that living ground cover. That's how the soil is healed. That's how the carbon is created. That's how the organic matter levels are increased. That's how the infiltration happens. All those things happen because of that, and so however you can you can uh, can make that happen, that's critical. The living ground cover is really critical in in the operation, and everything else kind of feeds that. And I guess ultimately that feeds the biology under the soil, right? Which which is what really makes the the system healthy. But um, but the part that we I think can influence the most is is that living ground cover piece. So right. By the way, those sheep are certainly providing uh, great utility for you and are doing great things for the orchard and the, well, changing your soil. Uh, how's the marketing aspect of that been? Um, when you add more enterprises, you have to do, you have to wear your marketing hat a lot more often. Um, uh, care to share anything about marketing sheep, chickens, pigs, turkeys? <laughs> oh man, um, we're working on that. We have been a little bit, Davis, a little bit imbalance in the marketing area we are way more on the ground in our farm than we are online or in the marketing world and it's been a weakness of our farm like that is if i could give us a weakness that's it like we're not very good at the marketing end we just have too much time doing the farming end yeah. and sometimes you'll people that are really good at marketing but they're not really marketing anything great but we've got something great to market we just don't have time to market it very good yeah. so we, we got to figure out how to balance that this year though 
honestly, our sheep or what, if we're going to survive this year with all of the bad things, with all the flooding and everything else, it'll be our sheep that carried us through. So okay. stacking your industries is yeah. a real thing. Like it really is. And doing a good job of it. I mean, like when I say we do a thorough job of it, we know our sheep, we know our genetics, we know what we want. We get rid of the things that don't work. We, we you know, we cold hard. We, we are able with knowing our sheep to sell to people the things that they need better for their system and direct them that way. So it's, that's been a really great thing to help us with that market um, and we've been blessed. We've been blessed. We totally sold out on sheep. Um, and that's been, um, that's been good. And, and I guess to add to that, we run about um, 150 to 200 sheep. Um, so it's quite a few lambs. I mean, we had 300 and, I don't know, 300 and some lambs last mm -hmm. year. Right. And so, um, so it's quite a few to move, at least from our perspective, it's quite a few to move. And, uh, and so we could have sold a, a lot more, honestly. Um, this year, I feel like we actually finally have started getting into the market. We're, 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 we, this year, we found more of our markets. Like it's been a lot of work, but we're finding more of our markets and we're finding people that want animals that are raised this way. Okay. Um, and they, and, you know, people that are interested in hitting the markets of people that are, that would like to try our sheep in their market. And so, um, so there's, yeah. there's some of those things that are going out as far as, you know, people that reach out to us and us that we reach out to other people and say, Hey, we've got something that would fit with you. Um, you know, here's what we do. Here's who we are. Um, and that's been that, like I said, that's what it's going to keep us afloat this year is the fact that we had sheep to market where we don't have the almond crop this year to market because of all the flooding and problems that way. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Um, uh, I just want to, um, uh, one more time offer if there's anything else that you want to share anything that you think is really important um, otherwise i'd like to hear what's next where's where are things headed in the future for you <laughs> okay um i don't know that there's anything else I, I need to share or want to share um and we could go on forever about the farm but uh <laughs> um, that's that we need to talk about right now no um i think the future it looks really bright we're really excited about the future um I mentioned earlier, but next year, and we say that in a cliche way, but uh, we're really excited about next year. The trees look really good. There's a lot of a lot of blossoms and buds, not blossoms, but buds that will turn into blossoms. You can tell the difference between leaves and blossoms on the trees. And so, um, and so we're very excited about it. And as the as the years have three last three years have gone by, our costs have been reduced. Um, so that's helped a lot. Um, and we feel like each year it's gotten it's gotten better. Um, the uh, the trees look better. The opportunity or the the uh, potential for a high crop or higher crop is is better every year, um, so we're we're very excited actually. And we're I think this year we said earlier, but I think this year we're working on marketing a lot. Um, that's probably the piece that we need to work on the most. But I think we're getting making good progress there, we're making really good progress. So we're excited for what next year brings. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities that are starting to manifest themselves. So I think I did what Zach said. One thing that I would say more, and this is. Um, I think that, you know, we started with this idea of regenerative, like we said, and then we found out that it was regenerative. There was a name and there was principles that we were still just touching the, you know, the tip of the iceberg on. Um, but I feel like as we progress further into it, I feel like the horizon just keeps getting bigger. Like the idea that we could hold enough water to produce almonds on less water, that we can infiltrate the water that comes down from the sky instead of fighting it like most like what we would used to have to. Mm -hmm. I feel like all of a sudden the potential for our orchard is beyond what we had even started out hoping for. And that to me is so exciting. Like that is just exciting to think because I mean, here in California, they're cutting back our water. They implemented Sigma this year and they're threatening 12 inches of water and it takes like 40 to 50, you know, to grow almonds. And, you know, people are going, okay, they're going to fallow land and we're going, I wonder how much water we could hold in our soil. Like how much could we do this? I mean, almonds are naturally a desert plant. Like the potential though is there and the hope is there as we change our soil and it becomes better, we will become more resilient for whatever comes through the years as our system becomes better as we we're healing it. It's still in a healing process here. We absolutely feel like it's in a healing process that, that our, our, um, our, our organic matter has to improve and it is improving, but it's not where we want it yet. And so as all that improves, everything just keeps getting better. Instead of that graph where you see the other farmer, he's burning up his resource, we're increasing ours. And to me, that is the exciting part about regenerative farming is that we're increasing, we're not decreasing. We're not burning up the soil that everybody says, oh, you petered out your farmland. We're saying my farmland gets better and better every crop I grow on it. 
every year I'm improving. It's becoming more resilient. We've got more bugs that are going to help fight bad bugs. We're going to, it's just exciting. Like, I mean, it really is exciting to feel that. And I think that to me is, I, I guess we talked to a lot of farmers that have inherited farms. We didn't inherit our farm. We're working our tails off to make these payments and they're still losing them. And I understand because with the agronomists, our first year, we collapsed his retirement to do everything that they recommended. And, you know, we were going, well, not even everything, just a part of it. And you go, this could happen so easily. I mean, you know, you could go under so fast if you do everything that they're telling you to do just in case something might happen. And you go, let's, let's cut back on the cost and let's start doing the things that make the ground amazing. And that to me is they could doctor us forever, but if we have real health inside of us, it's where it's at. So that's my thought on it. And I'm, and I'm also really excited to take even a bigger step back for our family. It's been a very, very great experience. I'm not going to say it hasn't been challenging, a lot of work hard sometimes, up late at night sometimes, but um, my relationship with my son and with my daughters has improved. Our relationship has improved. And so as a family, the future is very bright. So we're, we're very grateful for the opportunity that we've had to, to farm this way and to learn these principles. That's so. beautiful. Well, you guys, I think your story will uh, just inspire so many people within Regenerate Bag. I would ask you to go back to your uh, first slide where you share your uh, handle for social media. I um, just want to thank you again for taking this time um, to spend with us. I know this is part of your work day, and uh, for you to spend this time with us is greatly appreciated. And we're excited that um, people got to join live, but we'll also have this on our YouTube page as well. And I had you go back to this just so that people can follow along with your regenerative journey. Um, you have some great social media. I follow you on Instagram, and um, if anybody wants to follow along, there it is. Um, but thanks again. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Davis. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.